giving thanks to God the Father through him. So know that God has already set forth in his word that we're actually to teach and encourage one another by our singing. So if you think that you, you know, maybe you don't have a good voice or, you know, that's not a very manly thing to do, sing, take it up with the Lord, <laughs> right? just want to encourage you to sing, encourage you to sing. And you know, if it's not your preferred style or you don't like a certain song, you know, in all respect and love, I've heard this example given before, we aren't worshiping you, <laughs> right? We're worshiping the Lord. So do it with thankfulness in your hearts. So... Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Randy, for, for leading us in those songs. I uh, also wanted to just thank everybody. Sometimes on Sunday morning, I really kind of just get in the zone, and I'm not thinking about much else. But uh, two, yeah, two weeks ago, we had a, a pastor appreciation potluck and, and celebration. And uh, I just want to thank you all so much for uh, loving on me and my family. And uh, I love you guys so much. And uh, your love was definitely felt in all that you did and uh, the cards that you wrote. I uh, very, feel very blessed to be here, very humbled uh, by the things that you said. Um, like, who are they talking about? You know, not me. Um, because y'all y'all just uh, shared a lot of love and it really humbled us. So thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for that. Thank you for just welcoming our family um, and making us feel like um, we're at home. So thank you. Um, all right, well, let's, let's pray and open up God's Word. Father, we thank you for who you are, and Lord, we thank you for your Word. God, we don't have to wonder what you have said, what's true about you, what's true about us, or the mission that you've given us, because here it is in black and white, this is your Word. And so, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would guide me and guide all of us, God, as we go through your Word that we would all be students of your word together. And Lord, bless us this morning. Change us. And Lord, help us to glorify you in our life. Lord, give us a heart for our community, that we might share the good, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, the reason for the hope that is in us, as Peter says, to a lost and dying world. And Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to not read through the entire passage at the outset. We're going to go through it verse by verse in just a second. Um, but I want to remind us of why I go through the context of a certain passage every single week. You might get a little bit tired of it, um, but just as an example, if someone sent you a, a really long email, right, or a really long letter, or a really long text message, and you wanted someone else to read it, and get the gist of it, or understand a certain part of it, you wouldn't have them read the very end, right? You wouldn't have them jump right in the middle. If they're going to understand what the middle says, they need to start from the top and go all the way down, right? So that's exactly what we do with God's Word. I don't want to put my own opinions in there. Uh, none of you want to put your own opinions in there. We want to let God's Word speak for itself, right? And so to do that, we want to follow the context. What is Paul getting at? Not what do I want it to say, but what is Paul actually about in this letter? We know that the Holy Spirit used these men of God to convey God's actual word. So all the more reason to pay attention to context. So, when we go all the way back, right to Ephesians chapter 1 Paul starts his letter with a greeting and then he worships God right he doesn't get down to business he just worships God for giving us every spiritual blessing in Christ and then he prays for believers that they would grow in their knowledge of these spiritual blessings right reflect on it meditate on it have these realities lead and guide and control more and more of your life that's in verses 15 through 23 of chapter 1. In chapter 2, Paul switches gears and says, All of us, before you know God, before God does anything in your life, all of us are sinners, right? All of us are dead in our sin, right? Not just weak, not just sick, but spiritually dead, no life, right? That's a strong statement. 
And that is until God makes us alive together with Christ. He uses a description of the gospel that is just amazing. Not only are we forgiven of our sins, not only are we given eternal life, right? All the things we normally associate it with uh, salvation. He says, more than that, you are made alive together with Christ. So your life is, is intimately bound up in Jesus' own life. So you are made alive together with Christ. You were raised up together with Christ. And then you were seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. And so then, that's in chapter 2, right? It's all of God's grace, salvation is. And every part of salvation is a gift from God, right? Our memory verse, it's not of your own doing, right? It's simply God's gift to you. And none of us can boast in any part of salvation. It is all God, all of God. And the purpose of describing salvation like this, this is the state of all of mankind, Later in chapter 2, Paul then is going to apply that to Jews and Gentiles, right? Because they were at odds with each other. They were at odds with each other. There was hostility. There was bitterness. There was feelings of superiority, right? And so in chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, we saw that the Gentiles are invited to the table of God as citizens of the people of God and members of God's house through Jesus for eternal life, just like the Jews, right? And that might not be a novel or uh, amazing concept to us, but to them in that day, it was, right? We also saw that the people of God, the church, is, is a beautiful thing that reflects the grace of God, right? In that there is truly a diverse group of people from all walks of life, even formerly that, that would have been at odds, right? That wanted to hate and kill each other. But God has truly brought them near to him and to each other in Jesus Christ. That is the radical nature of the gospel, of salvation, right? So the reality, the, uh, the definition of the church is an example of God's grace, right? An example of God's radical grace. And that's God's desire all people from all nations, tribes, and tongues to be united by Christ and one with each other. So we talked about last week that everyone belongs because of Christ, right? And all are equal because the foundation of the church, right? The lifeblood of the church and the lifeblood of each individual believer's life is Jesus Christ himself. That is the common denominator. So, if you're a believer in Christ, you belong, right? And all the ways that we might divide ourselves, or heap up these differences, or throw up barriers, we shouldn't, right? All one in Christ. So, that's the context. That brings us up to chapter 3. We're in chapter 3. Praise God, right? <laughs> Making some headway. And... Uh, I, I, I told my wife that, hey, we're going to cover 13 verses today. And she, she, uh, she's like, okay, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's get into this. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Let's look at this together. So Paul says, for this reason, I... Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. And one thing to note, he says, for this reason, and then he never finishes it, <laughs> okay? All of what is in verse 2 to verse 13 is, is like a parenthesis. Paul's kind of getting distracted, and he's kind of fixating on his own life and his own mission, and then he'll pick up this, you know, for this reason in verse 14. If you look in verse 14, he says, for this reason, here's how I pray for you. So that's what he's starting. He's attempting to start praying for the believers, but then he gets distracted. Okay, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. This was actually fairly common in ancient writing. Okay, so it kind of throws us off like, oh, is he going to finish what he started there? It bothers us, but it was, it was more natural back then. Okay. So, here, Paul says, look, 
here's another proof that this is a reality, that, that we really are one in Christ. I'm in prison because of it, right? If this wasn't true, would I be a, in a Roman prison, right? This is a reality. You are one with each other, and because I believe that, because I'm taking the gospel to the Gentiles, I'm in prison. So let that stand as an example of why this is true. Verse 2 says, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. So again, Paul's saying, God gave me a specific mission to the Gentiles. And here he describes it as God giving him a certain management, a certain stewardship, like he's the, the steward of a home. On God's grace for the Gentiles. So again, Paul's saying in another way, I'm not making this up. I received this mission directly from God. And he says, this mystery was made known to me by revelation. I received Jesus' direct teaching on this. Where is that found? Well, a couple different places, but one good one is Acts 26. Paul, he's telling uh, the Roman authorities of his conversion. Okay, I was once a Jew. Uh, well, I'm still a Jew, right? But I was once a Jewish leader, and I was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus appeared to me and said, why are you persecuting me? Right? And that's when he was saved, or shortly thereafter. So he's telling of his conversion in Acts 26. And uh, in verse 16, he says, This is what Jesus said to me. Rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, right? Your mission is not to the Jews. I am sending you to the Gentiles, right? To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And again, not a novel idea to us, right? But to them, a very amazing idea. And this is a good transition to verse 4. Let's keep reading. Paul says, when you read this, verse 4 of Ephesians 3, sorry. Uh, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So this mystery of Christ is, is not a mystery any longer. Okay, He's referring to that original audience that this is something you did not know the fullness of based on the Old Testament. Okay, This is not God changing. This is not about the Messiah changing or God's word changing, but more is revealed now through me, Paul, but also through the prophets of the New Testament and also through the writers of the New Testament, the apostles, right? More about what Jesus truly came to do and what he did. Okay, so this is not the sort of mystery he's saying that you need to, you know, you need to sit down and meditate on and eventually God will give it to you. Okay, he's saying that this was formerly a mystery, meaning God had just not revealed it yet. And now that the Messiah has come, it's revealed, right? This is what God was doing. This is what it was all pointing to. So it's almost like when someone gives you a present, okay, and maybe it doesn't look like it's very big, uh, you, you start pulling the tissue paper out, and you pull one gift out, and then you realize there's still more in the them, right? As a kid, that was the most exciting thing, right? You pull one gift out, hey, there's more in here, okay? And you start pulling things out, and maybe there's like 10 things in there, okay? So the Old Testament, in a way, is, is, is like that gift. You have the gift before you, but you, you really haven't been able to unwrap it fully yet. 
But now in Jesus Christ, he is that gift. And look, you get all of it, right? You get to pull all of it out and see all of it in front of you. So it's the same present, right? Nothing about God has changed, but now you know what's in the gift, right? You know what's in the gift. In the Old Testament, you have the Messiah promised, right? But when Jesus comes, we begin to see the richness and the depth and the fullness of all of what he came to do. That is Paul's point. And then verse 6, let's read verse 6. Paul gives us the mystery, right? So, like I said, this is not something that you in your Christian life, you have to sit down and say, God, you know, reveal to me what this means. Paul says it right here. <laughs> okay, verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles, all who are non-Jews, are fellow heirs, right? Members of the same body. The Greek word there is, is one word, same body, <laughs> right? And then partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, right? So all these things in the Old Testament that Jews would say that these are ours, right? The inheritance of the land, the inheritance of the promises, right? That the body of the people of God, right? This entity and all these things that we're looking forward to as the people of God. Paul says this mystery, this thing that was formerly not revealed, is that all those who come to Christ in faith, all of that belongs to them as well. All of that belongs to them as well. When you look at the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, the Gentiles could join the Jews, but they had to be circumcised. And then also as tradition went, they had to uh, complete a, a form of like ritual purification. So that was added later on. And so there was kind of a separate but equal mentality. We're still the Jews, and you're not, okay? And again, God didn't do that. God didn't have the Jews separate for the reason of saying the Gentiles were, were worse off, okay? It had a specific purpose in time and history, and we went over that a couple weeks ago. But the Jews also added to that and added there was hostility there. There was bitterness. And so the point here is, the Messiah, what all history is pointing to, Jesus Christ, he doesn't provide a certain salvation and inheritance and house and promise to the Jews and then another one or a lesser one for Gentiles. Right? They are now one through Jesus Christ and that inheritance, that salvation is one and the same. So Paul uses strong language here. The Gentiles are fellow heirs fellow inheritors of the same family, the same body, and share in the same promises as the Jews. And that would have been very, very novel, very, very uh, crazy of an idea to, to many Jews back in that day. Listen to how this is promised and prophesied in Isaiah 56. Old Testament. It says, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord and minister to Him, to love the name of the Lord and to be His servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be a, called a house of prayer for all peoples." And if, you're, if you've read, uh, read the scriptures in John chapter 2, Jesus references this scripture after he drives the people out of, out of the temple. And he says, uh, well, actually, that's a different verse. Um, that's zealous for my house. But in driving out the people uh, from the temple, this is, is cited in one of the Gospels, that my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And then he continues, Isaiah does, he says, the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. So, when we look at this, this mystery, okay, the Jews and Gentiles becoming one or having uh, equal access to God, it wasn't a new thing. Okay, it was prophesied and promised in the Old Testament. 
But the fullness of it and the how of it was not revealed until Jesus Christ came. So Paul here is saying something really important to the Jews. You are to treat Gentiles who believe in Jesus as brothers, as friends, heirs with you to the promises of God because in Jesus you are one family. The Old Testament points to Jesus ultimately. Okay, not the Jewish people as an end, right? But to Jesus Christ. And so this affects how you read your Bible, right? The entire Bible is, is full of good examples of people who had faith and were used by God, but also the contrary, right? <laughs> but it's primarily a story. When you, when you look at the overarching theme of the Bible, it is primarily a story about the need, promise, revealing, ministry, and victory of the Messiah. Period. Right? On behalf of sinners like you and me from every nation, tribe, and tongue. It's even what uh, God promised to Abraham, right? That he would be a blessing to all the families of the earth, not just his people, right? So, the way this applies, if you believe in Jesus for salvation, and think about it, if you don't feel like you belong, in some way, right? Because of some reason or another, look what the text says about all who trust in Christ. You have the same inheritance as the next Christian. To whoever you would compare yourself to, you're the same. Period. You're the same. It doesn't matter if you're new to church, right? New to following Christ. Or if you're raised in the church, been a believer for a very long time, you have the same inheritance. You are of the same body, and you are partakers in the same promises. And also think about how countercultural this is, right? Our world, you see it on the news all the time. Our world is so divided, right? It's so full of hate. There are people who just purposefully stir it up, right? More and more and more. And there's always a pressure to, to divide, right? To compare yourself to other people. So full of strife and pride and envy. So think about it. Instead of just sitting back and saying, oh no, right? God has given us this message for a reason, right? We need to take this message to the world that you can have real peace with God and real peace with each other and a true and eternal brotherhood with even your worst enemy because of the radical love and grace of God. That's the gospel. Right? That's the gospel. The nature of the body of Christ shows the wisdom of God, shows the grace of God, shows the power of God. Right? You can be divided in every other thing on this earth, and yet you both come to Christ, and you, you can call each other brother or sister in Christ. Right? There's nothing else that can do that. Nothing else that can do that. Verse 7, look, it says, Of this gospel... I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. So again, this specific mission to the Gentiles, he, he reiterates this, that God gave this to me as a stewardship, as a gift. It was a specific gift of grace by the working of his power. And you see, Paul didn't view his conversion, his salvation, or his calling to the Gentiles as a matter of him you know, choosing God or seeking to do something good for God. He said, God stepped in and he saved me. And then God stepped in and he gave me this mission. Right? He didn't really include himself in the picture at all. Except verse 8, that's where he includes himself in the picture, right? To me, I'm the very least of all the saints. Right? I was the one who persecuted the church of God, and yet God saved me, right? So think about that. Someone who comes to faith, you know, they, they believe in the, the Roman gods or the Roman state religion. They come to faith, uh, great, or you're a Jew, you come to faith, but then you also have this guy over here who's been persecuting believers in Jesus Christ, and he comes to faith. What is this grace of God? Like, how can I even wrap my head around it that God could change someone like that? 
You know, then you look at yourself. How could God change someone like me? And yet he did, right? So all of it, one in Christ, all of it is a testimony to God's power, the working of his power. You should see that in your life, both in your salvation and your walk. From start to finish, that your life is now a walking testimony of the working of God's power. The working of God's power. And he calls himself, in verse 8, the very least of all the saints. And he did that because you know, I didn't deserve anything God gave me. Maybe even, even more so, in a sense, because I was, I was actively and, and uh, violently working against what God was doing in the world. Right? And he says earlier that God appointed me to be a servant. Right? And this is so unlike worldly leadership. Right? This is so unlike... Uh, the, the worldly people that are put up in front of us as examples, right? Paul says, I, God made me a servant, right? And, and in, I think in the ESV, it's, you know, it's translated servant. In the introductions to many of Paul's letters and, and the other apostles' letters, they say, you know, I, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, right? I, Peter, a servant of Jesus Christ. The word there in the Greek, it can be translated servant, but the word for it is slave, so we have these examples, these worldly examples of leadership, right, that are put before us, that this is who you should be, this is how you should act, and how you should talk, right, and this is what real success looks like. Here we have it in black and white, right, true Christian leadership, Jesus, right, humility, making much of God, not much of myself, right, pointing to God in all things. And that doesn't mean you put yourself down or denigrate yourself, but your life is a walking testimony of what God has done. Right? That is true Christian leadership. And that's what Paul's exhibiting here. He says, I am the very least of all the saints, and yet this grace was given to me, this very specific mission uh, from God to go to the Gentiles. Right? If God hadn't have stepped in, I probably would have persecuted these same people. And yet, now I'm bringing the message of salvation to them. Who could do that but God, right? And here he says in verse 8, this was what God gave me to do, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul says, my mission is to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. You know, there's, there's been a few times in my life, not nearly enough, that I've been able to go to the mountains I've been to Mount Whistler in, in uh, Vancouver. I've been to the Guadalupe Mountains in Texas. Some may say that doesn't count, but they have a rugged beauty about them. Um, and I've been to the, the San Juan Mountains in, in southern Colorado a few times. And, uh, you know, the, the few times that I've been to those different places, the scale really gets to me. You know, I, I feel how truly small I am <laughs> and how truly uh, huge God is, right? And it's also beautiful, so beautiful. Uh, when, I, when I think back to those trips, even some, you know, more than a decade ago, I can still remember them because of how much of an impression they made on me. So those are beautiful, right? That's is a valuable memory to me. And I also think about my children, that I am, I am blessed <laughs> to have four wonderful children, uh, day in and day out to see them grow, uh, to be there when they were born, right? Uh, to see my oldest son, Titus, be saved and, and baptized and growing in his faith, uh, to see my children learn um, and be crazy. <laughs> it's priceless to me. It's beautiful to me. I, I can't really put it into words. And I wish I could treasure it more. You know, in a similar way, my, my wife is a treasure to me. Right? She's so kind and tender-hearted and beautiful. She takes care of our household and our children She's worthy of praise, like Proverbs 31 says, 31 says. But here's the thing. I think we don't grasp this in Scripture. Even if you take all three of those examples, you know, the mountains, my children, my wife, and anything else you want to put in there, even if you take all three of those examples, they don't even come close to describing Jesus. It says in Him are unsearchable riches. Right? You can't even compare him to anything else. 
And even into eternity, after 10,000 lifetimes, you'll never be able to comprehend his worth. You will never come to the end of it. So I hope you see how special it is to come here together and open the Word of God and be together and sing praises to Him. This is what we do week in and week out. We declare and cherish the worth of Jesus. Right? We lift Him up. We look to Him. We study the worth of Jesus. So whatever's going on in our lives, whatever we're feeling, whatever we're experiencing, whatever is happening in the world, we still choose to lift up and behold the risen Christ because in Him are unsearchable riches. There's a beauty to this word, unsearchable. It means to track out with a negation on the front, so unable to track it out to the end. You cannot see the end of it. You can try to examine the riches of Christ, the richness of who Jesus is. You can try to examine all those spiritual blessings and all of who Jesus is and try to know them all and try to find the end of them, but you will never be able to, is what Paul is saying. So I pray you know this Jesus. I pray you know Him. I pray you don't come here to do church. I pray that you come to know Him more, right? That you come to know Him together. You appreciate the richness of who He is each and every day. You know, yes, he, he forgives you of your sin, and that in and of itself is a miracle, right? Only by His grace. But in Scripture, we know that He's, he's also your Lord. He's also your Master. He's also your friend, your counselor, your king, your cornerstone, your very life, your identity, your rest, your peace, your good shepherd. Right? We could go on and on and on. So I pray that you know this Jesus. I invite you to believe in Him even now. Come with your nothing. You have nothing to bring Him. Right? He has every reason to reject you. And yet He doesn't. That's the grace of God. Repent of your sin and trust Him for everything. That's eternal life. You now have the unsearchable riches of Christ. That might seem like it's too easy, but that's just your pride getting in the way. Because God knew that we could never do enough. And that's why Jesus is who He is. That's why He did it all. And again, when we think about this, the unsearchable riches of Christ, we can complain about our country, we can complain about our culture all day long, but until we start preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ to our dying culture, nothing will ever change. That's what our dying world needs. So where, whatever you do, wherever you go, preach the word. Preach the word. It was the very reason we did what we did yesterday. You know, we, yeah, we want to help people out with some physical needs, right? If they need clothing or, or household items, but God forbid that 50 people come and go from our church and they hear nothing of Christ, right? And that should be the, the motto of your life, too, that someone would come in and out of your life and never hear about Christ. Right? So we're not to be ashamed of the gospel. We're to embrace it and stand upon it and let it loose. Why? Paul says in Romans 1, he says, because it's the power of God for salvation for all who believe. Right? Why would you be ashamed of that which saved you? Right? Give it to others. Just like Paul's giving it to the Gentiles. In verse 9 it says, you know, I came to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. And in verse 9, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So again, like chapter 1, this, this gives us a look in history. Is history just a big cycle that has no end and is all really hopeless? No. 
God is in command of history from start to finish. It is all under his direction. God gets exactly what he wants in history. And that's something to cling to. So what is God doing right now in the world? Paul says God used him to get this message out there that God is going to use the church. Little old me, little old you, right? Paul himself, any other believer in Jesus Christ, that God is going to use us as believers, the least of all the saints, Paul says, right? To show the manifold wisdom of God to the entire universe. But specifically here to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Who are these authorities? So it might just be angels. Okay? And, and, and Peter, uh, one of the letters of Peter, he says that the angels long to look into redemption. So they're like a captive audience into how God is saving us and using us. But it could also involve uh, Satan and his cohort as well. Okay, regardless, either option, whether just the angels or all the spiritual realm, your life with each other, you being one in Christ, Paul says here, shows the eternal plan of God for redemption to the entire universe and shows the wisdom of God in doing that. And this mirror is Chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, right? It says that your life with other believers in Christ is a showpiece of the grace and kindness and love and wisdom of God. So it's a showpiece. And here, you know, I acknowledge that many people struggle with purpose and calling in their lives. You know, what does God want me to do? But understand, look, God says, well, here's what's already happening. When I save you, your life becomes a showpiece to the universe, <laughs> right? To the entire spiritual realm. They can't help but say, look at the wisdom of God in doing this, right? So whatever you feel like, right? If you feel aimless, okay, know that God has given you, given your life this purpose. Your life is a showpiece of the glory of God to the universe. It's an amazing thing. Verse 11 says, This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So Paul kind of ends this section by applying it to the Ephesian believers themselves. Right? They're, they're true of God and his eternal plan and what's true about us as the church. He applies it personally to these believers, right? He first says that we have boldness and access with confidence. A lot of synonyms there, right? To explain again that, hey, you know, you're not any less of a Christian because you're a Gentile, right? You're not any less of a Christian because of who your parents were or what you chose to do with your career, right? Or, or how many kids you chose to have, right? Or if you grew up in church uh, versus you're very new to the church, it doesn't matter who you are. If you have salvation in Christ, if you know Christ, then you're one. You have the same access, right? You can pick up the phone and get God every single time in prayer, whether you're a Jew or not, right? Whoever you are. And you can hear from God through the Word anytime, right? You don't have to be on a waiting list behind other people who are more spiritual or whatever. Okay, there's one in Christ. We are all one in Christ. You have unhindered access to God as your good shepherd. Think about this. Every reason God would have to not love you or to not include you has been dealt with at the cross. There's none left. There's no reason left. He is truly your father now. You belong to him and he belongs to you. And there's nothing that's going to change that. That's the beauty of the gospel. All of that has been dealt with on the cross. And not only between us and God, but here's the beauty of it that Paul is so focused on, but between us and the next person. Right? There's nothing to divide you and the next person now. Right? You're one in Christ. 
So verse 13, he says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So you think about it, in most cases, people would look down in that day and age, look down on someone in a Roman prison, right? Like, God has abandoned you. Or, you know, God's plans have been frustrated. What are you going to do now, Paul? Right? And so he says, don't lose heart over what I'm suffering for you. Why? He says, because it is your glory. It actually proves that what God is doing is true, is genuine. See in Acts how many times that God has used the imprisonment of the saints, right, to further the gospel even more, right, to put to shame the earthly rulers that were trying to imprison them, right? So uh, Paul being in prison is nothing to God, right? And so he says, don't lose heart. It doesn't even really matter. <laughs> On the contrary, he gives it a positive thing. He says, it's actually your glory, right? My suffering is your glory. William Barclay writes, he says, When the knights of chivalry came to the court of King Arthur and to the society of the round table, they came asking for dangers to face and dragons to conquer. And so he says, To suffer for Christ is not a penalty, right? Or a misfortune, even. It is our glory, for it is to share in the sufferings of Christ himself. So Paul says, This is not a setback, right? This is in the plan of God, and it's for your benefit. It's your glory. Amazing, amazing. So this time, I want to invite you. If you don't know this Jesus, we've been talking about the marvelous grace of God this whole time. I invite you to know Him solely based on what He's done, His perfect life and His perfect death. You repent of your sin and have faith in Him, and you will have eternal life because it's based solely on His grace. I also invite you, if you have any prayer needs, I'll be at the front during this last song. Uh, if you want to pray, I would love to pray with you. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, send that to me during the week, and we would love to serve you. We would love to pray with you. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the, uh, the goodness of your word, God, that even though uh, Paul is writing to these people uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, God, that's the nature of your word, that we can continue to glean from it and renew our minds with it and be changed by it even though it was written to them so long ago, uh, so also it is written to us um, in the power of your Spirit. Father, I pray if anyone does not know you, they would trust solely in Christ and never look back. And Lord, we know that your Spirit is faithful to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.